Living Seed Media brings to you God's Word, which is His comprehensive equipment for changing lives. May the Lord impact your heart as you encounter His Word. For further inquiry or counsel, contact Peace House, P.O. Box 971, Boko, Benue State, Nigeria. Telephone numbers 0703 036359, 0703 768119. Email address lsmedia at livingseed.org or visit our website at www.livingseed.org. Let us sit back and listen as the servant of God brings forth the word of life. There are a few things that God will have me begin to deal with and the first of it will be to look at what is the message that subdues the earth. When God was speaking to Adam and said, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, subdue it. I was wondering what did God put in his hand with which to subdue the earth. The curiosity of what does he have to subdue the earth uh, made me to want to look at so what exactly does God put in our own hands by which he's giving us this commission again. Uh, yesterday night we came on to the point of looking at the life that God will want to fill the earth with. And we saw that that life must be the new creation. The life that Christ and him crucified has released into our lives. But because I want to also look at that as the life, the message that is capable of subduing the earth. I will want to take a few steps backward as we move forward, as the Lord will be leading us. Now, if you are familiar with the story of creation in Genesis chapter 1, you will notice that the Bible said in the beginning, Genesis chapter 1, I'll read verse 1, 2, and 3 at this time, or up to verse 4. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And the earth was without form and void. And darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. And God saw the light that it was good. And God divided the light from the darkness. Now, if we quickly pick that Genesis chapter 1 uh, from other versions that we can quickly uh, look at, for you to see the condition of the earth at that very, very point at which God was bringing an intervention of light, that will give you a picture of what exactly it is that God is asking us to subdue with. I mean, subdue the earth with. Now, can I ask you to please go with me to Genesis chapter 1. Those of you that have uh, other versions, like the message, if you have a message version, please help us bring it out. We'd like to read it together. For this, first this, God created the heavens and the earth. All you see and all you don't see, God made them all. Yes, go ahead. But now we notice something that is very strange about the earth. Because if God is the one that made the heavens and the earth, and we are told that there is great order and beauty in the heavens, you will not be expecting God to create something that is a bunch of confusion, 
a bunch of problems, a bunch of uh, a nothingness. But now we are told that the earth was a soup of nothingness, a bottomless emptiness, an inky blackness. And God's spirit brooded like a bed above the watery abyss. So we noted that there's a challenge with the earth. I read from the Amplified Bible before I come back there. It said the earth was without form and empty waste. You know, those are the issues that I want you to note about what the earth was. That the earth was without form and an empty waste. Darkness was upon the face of the very great deep. The Spirit of God was moving, hovering, brooding over the face of the waters. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. Now, if as we go ahead, you will see in the course of our study that the first thing that is confronting the earth, that is making the earth restless, that is making the earth to become a, a soup of nothingness, that is troubling the earth and making the earth to be without shape, turning it to become void like an empty waste, turning it to be like a mere wilderness, we can see darkness. We can see the power of darkness struggling to turn the earth and make it formless and make it without shape and destroy the purpose with which God wanted the earth to fulfill a divine purpose. We can see that darkness is a very major, major contention over the earth. And you see, as we will be understanding, we read in the other passage when we were studying the book of Hebrews, we saw that God did not subject this world unto angels to control. And if God did not give it to angels, surely he has not given it to demons. God had not released the earth that it is the devil that will be running and governing this place. But we see the spirit of darkness. We see it, you know, engulfing everywhere bringing confusion every time. And for you to know that that is not the will of God, and God was not going to leave it so, we saw the Spirit of God overing, brooding, as if he's laboring, traveling for the emancipation of the earth from the power of darkness. But now, as we saw the word of God, the Bible says the answer that God gave to deal with darkness at that beginning, the Bible said, let there be light. And it was when God said, let there be light, that we saw that the light came and darkness was pushed back for the earth to be rearranged, for the earth to be given shape, for all the things that you now saw that was being brought forth by God on the face of the earth. So in chapter 1 verse 26, which we began to study, we saw God saying, Now come, let us make man in our own image, in our likeness. Let him have dominion. Dominion. Now, I will come on that, but I want you to note that if there was any matter why God was going to create man on the face of the earth, it was purely for that man to have capacity to stop darkness from overrunning the earth. God was looking for a man that carries his own nature, his own likeness, that can subdue darkness anywhere darkness is found. Now, the word of God went on to say, 
and let us and let us make man our own image and let him have dominion let him subdue darkness the earth ought not to be put in that soup of nothingness let us make man after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing. Now that has been the plan and the purpose of God. Now so when the word of God said, let us make man in our own image, the first question that was uh, coming strongly is for us to see what is that image? Now, let me ask you to follow me quickly to the book of John, chapter 1. John 1. Just for us to note one or two things there, and then we are going ahead. Now, in John, chapter 1, verse 1, it says, In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shined in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. The same came for a witness to bear witness of the light that all men through him might believe. He was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light which lightens every man that comes into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Now, I decided to read that chapter 1 from verse 1 to 14 to quickly establish the fact that if John chapter 1 begins by saying, in the beginning, and Genesis chapter 1 also begin by saying, in the beginning, it meant then that these two chapters, they must be speaking and describing the same time and the same event. It means that these two chapters have something in common that we need to understand. Now, but I'm not going to all of that in details. I'm only laying that in order to give us a take-off point to the kind of what has God, what, what life, what message, what instrument has God given man in order to subdue the earth. Now, we notice here that in the beginning, the Bible says, was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light, was the light of men. And the light shines in darkness, and the darkness cannot comprehend it, or the darkness cannot overcome it, or the darkness cannot envelope it. Now, so what does that immediately apply to us about? Which means, why we are looking at that Genesis chapter 1 verse 1 verse 2 verse 3 and God said, let there be light. He was calling forth 
This one that had been with him from the beginning, the one that the Bible said he was, I mean, the word was with God and the word was God and that he is in him life and that light was the light, the light of all men. And it is this light that shineth and darkness cannot comprehend it. So we notice that the world could not be restored back to shape unless the shining light. But this light, we said, is not electric light. It's not sunlight. Uh, those of you that want to study, you will notice that the light that God said, let there be light in chapter 3, in, in verse 3 of chapter 1, is different from the lights that God came now to create in chapter 1, verse 14, up to verse 19. So, this light that God was calling forth was not created. He was with God. Actually, the Bible says he was God. And at this light, from all indication, we are now noting as we came down to verse 14, that he is the son of the living God, the Lord Jesus. So, we realize that right at the beginning, to deal with darkness, God needed to call forth a light that is light. So when God finished all he was doing and he was going to now put man in charge and create a man that will carry his, his authority, what did God decide to do? He said, let us make man in our own image, in our own likeness. I came to look at all of this because I wanted to know that that life, that man that God was creating, he wanted him to carry a life that is light. A life that when it is shining, darkness cannot comprehend it. A light that when it is functional and when it's operating, darkness cannot subdue it. And if God was saying, subdue the earth, and God was not giving him uh, weapons like a uh, uh, gun, He's not giving him anything like a, a dagger or a sword. And God simply said, subdue the earth. With what does God want him to subdue the earth? He wants him to subdue the earth and bring darkness underfoot by the life that God poured into him. So when you go to chapter 2, you see how God did it. It might be important for me to deal with that quickly in a very short while. So that where we are going, what God wants to do, and the kind of ministry, the kind of commission that God is giving us, we might fully have an understanding of it. So I will again ask you to follow me. Let's quickly have a little picture of what did God do. In chapter 2, when God was now going to do the creation of man, I want you to see few issues there without uh, taking too long to deal with it. When you are free to study, it will be good for you to just sit down and look at that. But let's look at a few things there. In Genesis chapter 2, where God now decided to make man in his own image, let's look at it. Now, if you are reading from verse 1, you will have noted from verse 1, 2, and 3. But now, I want to start quickly from verse 4. These are the generations of the heavens and of the earth when they were created in the day that the Lord God made the earth and the heavens. And every plant of the field before it was in the earth and every herb of the field before it grew. For the Lord God had not caused it to rain upon the earth because there was not a man to till the ground. Again, when God begins to lay some principles down, I want you to bear it in mind and I'm praying that we can apply as we go. God did not cause it to rain on the earth because there was not a man to handle it. Sometimes we are praying and say, Lord, send down the rain. Lord, let the heavens open. And many of you are wondering why God has kept 
the heavens closed and he has not uh, opened the heavens as we have been expecting. It is because every anointing, every outpouring of the Spirit of God, every outpouring of the rain requires that there will be a man that can handle it. Even now that we are talking about the move of God that God is declaring to us, it is because God is again working to produce the kind of men and women that can handle what he wanted to do in these coming days. And please be deliberate as you are listening to the word of God this morning. Because there was not yet a man to till the ground, to handle it, all that God did was there was mist that went up from the earth and watered the whole face of the ground. Now, just for God to maintain things, he could allow mist. He could allow mist. Uh, so, and some of us, we have experienced a bit of mist. We have experienced some few things. You remember the song we used to sing, There shall be showers of blessing. This is the promise of love. There shall be seasons refreshing. Coming down from the heavens above, from the presence of the Father. Even though dews have come and gone, but what we are waiting for actually is the showers of blessing. But showers will never come until God has got men that he has prepared for it. This is in keeping with biblical principles. So right in chapter 2 of Genesis, all that could happen before God will get his man ready was just to have the mist to water the ground. But now, in verse 7, all of you, please, verse 7. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life a man became a living soul. And the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man whom he had formed. Now, in verse 7, there is a quick principle that I'm laying before we can go to where we are needing to go this morning. Trusting God that wherever we stop, we'll be able to see how to press on later on. Now, the first thing that God was going to do was to prepare a body into which he was going to pour this life that he wanted to bring to the earth. So the Bible says, God formed man of the dust of the ground. So you see, our physical body was formed from the dust of the ground. So that, and I wanted to know that it was no sin. There was no sin in this matter. God was making a man, but he's forming him as a jar of clay. As an earthen vessel. But inside that earthen vessel, God wants to pour his own life. Inside that earthen vessel, God's plan was to put in the life that is light. So that on the outside, you will see something that looks like ordinary clay. But inside, there is a treasure. And what is that treasure? The very life of God. And so the Bible said, And God breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. So if I'm able to describe the first man, the first man was made, you know, he had a body that is made of ordinary earth, ordinary dust, but he carried a life inside that is of God. So if we describe that, that would look like uh, God, God's life, but contained in a container of ordinary clay. Now I say that that did not happen because of sin. That was God's original plan. 
God was looking for a man on earth whose body will be made from the earth but whose life will come from above. Please get that. That's very important. I am rushing to be able to establish that this morning because you need to have an understanding of what God wanted. God wanted a man natural because his body is made from the earth. Is an earthen vessel. It's a jar of clay. But this man carries a life that comes from above. So there's a treasure inside which is coming from above, but it is going to be contained in an earthen vessel. And so this man was put in charge and put on the earth. And God said, have dominion. Have dominion. Fill the earth. He blessed him. He said, multiply. Fill the earth. Subdue it. Exercise dominion. I will look at that commission, but not today. Because that commission, we are going to go out with it when it is time for us to release you to go from this meeting. We'll be talking about what you are going from here to go and do. But the first thing I'm dealing with now is, with what are you going to subdue the earth? I saw that the first man, what God did for him, and it was sufficient. God put his life, but inside an earthen vessel. So when God said, the day you eat the fruit of that knowledge of good and evil, you will surely die. God was not first talking about the physical body that was made from the earth. He was talking about the life. The life light that he pours into him that makes him actually a living soul. What makes a man living is not the body. It is the life inside. When the life inside is no more there, you are as good as dead. So when that man disobeyed God and that light was quenched, even though we still saw him walking up and down, we still saw him moving, but that's a dead man. That's a man that is just carrying out the empty carcass of a physical body, but with a bastardized life that is no more from above. Now, and from that time, until Jesus Christ came to the cross, that was the kind of man that lived on the earth. A man that, even though his body was prepared to carry a life that is from above, but we found him now carrying rubbish inside that body that God gave him. And all the struggles, all the sicknesses, all the destructions that have come to the human body, and to the environment, and to the earth where he was meant to be living and governing was because the life that he ought to carry that can subdue the earth was already quenched. Now, let's go on. Having laid that foundation, I hope you'll be able to follow me from this point. Now that God is looking for another man to carry out his assignment on the face of the earth, what does God do to do that to, to, to the man he wants to use? What is the life that is put in us for us to be able to accomplish our assignment? We're going to pick one or two scriptures quickly so that again as I lay the foundation, we can build on it as the Lord will be helping us. Now, come with me. Come with me quickly to 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians and chapter 4. Thank you very much. Now, I want you to read from verse, uh, let me read from verse 3, but from verse 4, verse 5, uh, up to verse 6 and 7 is where I really wish we can spend a bit of time to understand. But if our gospel be hid, 
it is he to them that are lost. In whom the God of this world has blinded the minds of them which believe not. Let the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. I will come on this later on, but I just want you to follow me in reading so that I can get to where I'm going first before I return there. He said, for we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord and ourselves your servants for Jesus' sake. For God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness. If you remember, when did God command light to shine out of darkness? That was in Genesis chapter 1. That was when God said, let there be light. Now, look at that scripture now saying, for God who commanded light to shine out of darkness has shined. All of you, please take your Bible now. Look at it. All of you, please. Wherever you are, whether you are reading it in French, or you are reading it Hausa, or you are reading it in Udu language, or any language you have anywhere all over the world, please turn to that verse 6 again. He said, for God who has commanded the light to shine out of darkness has shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Don't forget that in the beginning we said, God said, let there be light. And we saw that that light that God said, let there be light, was not the sun, was not the moon, was not the starlight, was not electric light, was not any other form of light. The Bible said, this light that God is talking about is life. Say, so in him was life, and the light was the light of all men. So we saw that that light that God said, let it shine. And darkness cannot comprehend it from that very beginning. We are now noting here that God, instead of saying let there be light all the time, he has decided to do something. What did he decide to do? He has shined. You see, the little word that is very critical for us here is that he is not saying, that scripture is not saying, God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness has commanded us to go and shine. Did you notice that that's not what he said? There's a different passage where we are going to hear God talking about that. But here, the first word that God is saying is that it is that God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness that has by himself shined in our hearts. Does that now imply that that light that God commanded to shine, instead of God commanding it, has decided now to become resident in our own heart to shine? Now, this is a very critical matter I want God to help us to lay hold upon before we go ahead. That you will not be able to do anything serious to subdue darkness except the light, the light that is life that subdued darkness in the beginning has now found residence where? In your heart to shine. For God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness has shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Now look at that verse 7, all of you now. If you can help us flash it so that those that can look at it on their screen can check it. It says, but we have this treasure. What is this treasure? The life that is light, 
that is now resident in our earthen vessels. Now, this is the mystery that God must open your eyes to see. The kind of men that God wants to multiply on the face of the earth, they are earthen vessels. They are not gold. On the outside, they are ordinary brothers, ordinary men, ordinary women with earthen vessels, jars of clay. But now they carry within themselves a treasure. And this treasure is that life light that God had decided to come and be shining but in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Are you hearing? Are you following what we are talking about? May the Lord help you at this point. Now, because the only thing that can subdue darkness, that can subdue the earth from being decayed, from being destroyed, is light. And if the light is not electric light or sunlight, if it is a light that is life, then only those in whose heart such a light that is light is shining can actually have an effective authority to subdue the earth, to bring everything to order according to the will of God. Now, when the word of God said, but we have this treasure in an earthen vessel, it again brought something back that God had always wanted men, women, that on the outside, they look ordinary, but inside, there is the life light that is shining, that is breaking forth, that is subduing darkness, even wherever they go. Now, from that point, you will notice that we are now looking at vessels, men and women that God wants to relate with, bring up, so that Christ might live, might walk, might shine his life light inside them. That's the only man, that's the only woman that God not only wants to multiply, that's a man, that's a woman that will have relevance in laboring with God to subdue the earth and to prepare men for the coming kingdom. Praise the Lord. Now, having come to that point, can we now take it a little further and begin to speak in such simple things that you have interacted with generally? which we want to now put together in preparing us to, 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 to bear this commission, to be the man, the woman that God is longing for you to be even in his, this present day and in this assignment that God is bringing us into. Now, I want you to follow me to your scriptures. Let's turn our Bibles. Let's turn our Bibles to Colossians. Can I read from verse 12? Giving thanks unto the Father who has made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light, who has delivered us from the power of darkness and has translated us into the kingdom of his dear son, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. For by him were all things created, things that are in heaven, that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, 
All things were created by him and for him. And he is before all things, and by him all things consist. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. Verse 19. For it pleased the Father that in him should all fullness dwell. I know, brothers and sisters, that since I started reading from verse 12 to verse 19, you know whom we are talking about. We are talking about Jesus. We are talking about him in whom we have been delivered from the power of darkness. And we are talking about him in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. Now, we are talking about him who is the image of the invisible God, who is the express likeness of God. So, now we are come back now. When God said, let's make mine our own image and our own likeness, now we found that whereas none of us met the first man before he died, none of us ever experienced the first man that carried that life before he fell into sin. But now we found Jesus. But now we see Jesus. We now see Jesus who is the express image of the invisible father. According to Hebrews chapter 1, the Bible says he is the, perm- the perfect imprint. He is the complete expression of the father in every form. But now we are reading from that verse 15. By him all things were created. All things that are in heaven, things that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. That will be in keeping with what we read in John chapter 1 verse 1 and verse 2, that there was nothing that was made that was not made by him. You will also notice that from this scripture, all things were created by him, whether things in heaven or things on earth, underneath the earth, principalities, powers, angels, thrones, dominions, things that are visible, things that are invisible, they were all made by him and for him. All the authority of creation belongs to him. And now the Bible said everything was made for him and it was made by him. And that he is before all things. So it is by him. It is in union with him. It is in connection with Jesus that all things find their proper place. If you read that verse 17 from the, ampli- I mean from the, uh, is it a, a Good News Bible? Good News says it is in union with him that everything, everything find coercion. It is in union with him that everything finds their proper place. So all of this is talking about him, Jesus. And without connecting with him, you are already misplaced in life. Without making him your, without uniting your life with him and let his life become the life in you, you are already out of place. Now, I could have loved to stop at that point and just talk about Jesus, talk about his glory, talk about his power, and, and all of us say, so what concerns us about him is already there. But there is a connection. There's something that is bringing us into this discussion. And that is making me and you to be relevant on the face of the earth for what God wants to accomplish at a time like this. Now, so look at verse 20. Verse 20 says, And having made peace through the blood of his cross, by him to reconcile all things unto himself, By him I say whether they be things in earth or things in heaven. And you, and you, 
that were sometime alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now as irreconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. Now this Jesus for whom all things were made by whom all things were made the one that has the fullness of God the one that has all the things that are in heaven things that are on earth all the visible and invisible things dominions, thrones principalities and powers that has all of that he came down he came down to become a man just like you and me in order to do something and what did he come down to do to make peace the enmity that started between us and God through wicked works through the sins that we have committed and sins that we are still committing and through that old nature Mr. Flesh that continues to be an enemy of God but in our hearts Jesus came down to make peace through the blood of his cross by him to reconcile all things unto himself, by him I say, whether they be things in earth or things in heaven. And you, 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 you see, when I came to that scripture and I see the word of God say, you, and I see the finger of God pointing at me and say, you, and I see God pointing that same finger at you, you, Say, and you that were sometime alienated and enemies in your mind through wicked works, yet now as irreconciled in the body of his flesh through death. You remember I described the death on the cross to present you holy. So what Jesus Christ did when he came to reconcile, to, to break the middle wall between us and God and to discard the enmity, the enmity between us and God, another version, maybe if we read it in Ephesians, say, to abolish, to abolish the enemy between us and God. And what is that? The flesh. He brought it down and completely you know, uprooted it that we might be reconciled to God that he may present you holy, unblameable, and unreprovable in his sight. This kind of uh, description of what Jesus Christ came to do and the kind of man that God wants to produce in the new creation is very, very serious. It's very, very serious and it's difficult for me to quickly rush over it in a short moment. But it's okay to say that when Jesus Christ had come to lay down his life and to take upon himself our own old nature and he went to the cross of Calvary with it, it was so that he might reconcile us to God in the body of his flesh through death, it is that he might present you holy, unblameable, and unreprovable in his sight. As if once this new life that Jesus Christ is bringing back to us, once it's resident in your heart, you'll be able to walk with God in holiness. You'll be able to walk in an unblameable manner and you will be able to stand before God unreprovable as if God will not see any fault in our lives anymore. If you, if you, look at the big if in verse 23, all of you please. If you continue in the faith, 
Some people will like to stop in verse 22 and say, yes, yeah, he has presented us holy, unblameable, unreprovable in his sight. And so they say, yes, there's no problem. I can live anyhow now. It's finished. But take note, there's a precondition for it. If you continue in the faith grounded and settled, if you are not moved away from the hope of the gospel, which you have had and which was preached to every creature which is under heaven. Now, permit me to go to that passage from the Amplified Bible, if I can get it now. Yes, although, verse 21, you at one time were estranged and alienated from him, and you were of hostile attitude of mind, in your wicked activities. And several of us, you will testify to the fact that that's what we were. That's the kind of man we were. Yet now, has Christ reconciled you back to God in the body of his flesh through death in order to present you holy and faultless and irreproachable in his father's presence? And this he will do, provided that you continue. You continue to stay with and in the faith in Christ. If you continue to be well grounded and settled and steadfast, not shifting or moving away from the hope which rests on and is inspired by the good news, by the gospel which you have heard and which has been preached has been designed for and offered without restriction to every person under heaven of which gospel I, Paul, became a minister. I was hoping I'm going to stop at this point because that is where me and you are going to come into the matter. Now, what is the first issue I have arrived at now? That when God told the first man, subdue the earth, what God gave him to subdue the earth is his life, the life light. If not that the man disobeyed God and that life died, and that made him a victim, that made him very weak, that made him to become subservient to the devil and to the prince of darkness, all men that are born of a woman, they, were, they lie under the power of darkness because of the life they carried. They cannot reign because the life of darkness that they carry, the flesh, can never subdue the earth. No way. But now, if we are going to subdue the earth, if we are going to reign on the earth for Jesus, if we are going to establish the kingdom of God on earth, it will also be by his life. It's not first by one external activity. It will be by his life that he has now poured into us. It is his life in you that will give the, the strength, that will give the victory, that will give the power that overcomes the world. Now, several of you, you have read scriptures, and I know you know it in your head. John chapter 4, first John 4, 4 says, Little children, you have overcome them. Not because you are tall. Not because you are huge. Not because you are doing something serious. You have overcome them because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. It is the life that God gave the man in the first place that gave him authority to subdue the earth. But when he lost that life, he cannot subdue the earth because he has no life to so do. He had no life that can subdue the earth anymore. He only became a victim. He became a slave. He was pushed up and down. And all that he had to do he was struggling because he lost the life. Death actually began to reign over all mankind because of the life he carried. 
we were subject to the devil because of the life that we were born with. If we are going to now be victorious, if we are going to be subduing the earth, it will be by life. It will be by the life that Christ has now come to, to live inside of us. Now, Romans chapter 5. Let me ask you to read Romans 5 uh, quickly on this. So that as we are going on, because I'm going to now begin to link to where we are standing. How am I going to subdue my earth? It will be first by life. Not by shouting, but by shining the light that is light. How am I going to affect my generation? First and foremost, the greatest weapon by which you are going to be an overcomer is the life inside you. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. It is because of that life, Christ's life, that you can have the hope of victory, the hope of reigning. Please look at Romans 5. In Romans 5, please come with me to verse 17. Verse 17. Yeah, verse 17. For if by one man's offense, death reigned by one, much more they which receive abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness shall reign in life. How will they reign? They will reign in life by one, Jesus Christ. So may we quickly note now that to live a life that can reign in life, that can exercise dominion, and by the grace of God can subdue the earth, it will be not because we are spending money. It will not be because we are arguing with anybody. It will be because we reign by the life that Christ has come to live inside of us. So the weapon that God gave the first man, he has restored it to us, but even in a greater manner. Whereas the Bible said the first man became a living soul when that life was poured into him, now that we have this new man, the resurrected Lord, he has made us now to have a quickening spirit. He said, if the spirit of him that raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he will quicken your mortal body. We have the quickening spirit dwelling here that can reign. So look at that verse 17. He said, for if by one, one man's offense, death reigned by one, much more they which receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one, Jesus Christ. Therefore, as by the offense of one, judgment came upon all men, to condemnation. Even so by the righteousness of one, the free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. For as by one man's disobedience, many were made sinner. So by the obedience of one, hallelujah, shall one, shall many be made righteous. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound, but where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. That as sin has reigned unto death, even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. Now, you know, I came to stop at that point because I want you to first know that when yesterday you were coming to exchange the old life, you are coming to drop Mr. Flesh. You are coming to drop it at the feet of the cross. And God is giving you an exchange life. The first thing I want you to know is that your physical body has not changed because your body was not the problem. Your physical body did not, was not the offender. The offender was the man inside. It was the man inside that made you to enter into all the trouble you entered. 
Now that that man has been evacuated and crucified, God is bringing the very life, that life light that shines, is bringing it back to live but inside your mortal body. Now, it is this that we are going to begin to develop if we come back, if God permits us to come back in the night, this is the thing that we are going to begin now to look at. How do I carry this now and it will become my own weapon of establishing the kingdom of God on earth? Whether you are going to stand to represent God in the space of science or scientific research, it will be this life this life light. The Bible says in him is hidden all the wisdom, all the riches of wisdom and knowledge is inside that life. It is that life that when you allow him to express, to manifest, that we begin to see his outworking everywhere. But like I said, that's not what we are going to enter into now. What we are dealing with first is that we need to note that what God is giving me and you with which to affect our generation is his life. But this life is not the one that is up there in heaven. It's the life that he has decided to come and live but inside of you here on earth. So go with me now to that Colossians chapter 1. If I can end our discussion here this morning with that, that would be okay. Let's go to Colossians 1 again. You know, I ask you to stop in verse 23. Because Paul was introducing something, he said, it is for this reason I became a minister. It is for this reason God caught me. This is why God decided to capture me. This is what I was, I was born to carry. And because we came to that point, I will want you to come with me to read that passage a little further and then we will take that discussion to the point of our own able to pray our prayer this moment. Now, who now rejoice? In my sufferings for you, I'm back in verse 24. To fill up that which is behind of the afflictions of Christ in my flesh for his body's sake, which is the church. Wherefore I am made a minister according to the dispensation of God, which is given to me for you to fulfill the word of God. Even the mystery, which has been hid from ages and from generations, but now is made manifest to his saints, to whom God will make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. What is the mystery? It is that God wants to bring back to you Christ living in you, Working in you, operating in you as the basis of the glory we're expecting. It is this mystery. I know several of you are saying, Oh, Lord Jesus, Lord Jesus, Lord Jesus, oh, I want to I want you to help me. That's good. But I want you to know that the plan of God is that that same God who said, let there be light in the beginning. And there was light and darkness could not comprehend it. He has decided that he would take his residence in your heart. And it is from your own heart he wants to begin to shine, to deal with darkness and to subdue it and to establish the kingdom of God from your very life. It is this mystery that God wants you to, to get into before we go on from here. 
All the men that God wants to use to do anything for him on the face of the earth, it must be God, Jesus, living in them, working in them, both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Oh, because that's the extent to which I'll be able to go for this morning. That mystery is the only extent that we can deal with for now before we cry to God in prayer. And permit me to spend the rest few minutes we have here to, 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 to bring that out again that in the purpose of God and in the plan that God had which even though the devil interrupted it when the first man fell that same plan has not changed. Can I remind you few things that have not changed. Number one, the plan for God to use somebody on earth to establish his kingdom on earth and to deal with principalities and power for them to know the manifold wisdom of God has not changed. Angels don't have that privilege at all. And God is not looking to the side of angels to do it for him. He's looking at my side. He's looking at your side. That has not changed. One more thing that has not changed, I want you to note. Right from the beginning, God already decided that his life light that has power to subdue darkness will be resident in earthen vessels, in ordinary men, jars of clay, that has not changed. That no matter what God wants to do, this treasure, he wanted it to be in an earthen vessel so that inside us, he can operate and do what he wanted to do. This is the mystery. Christ in you. Christ working in you. Christ operating in you. Is the hope of glory. Now, please follow me. I'm dealing with an issue here, but God is going to give you understanding. You are going to rise from this MLR with an understanding that, oh God, it will be God at work in you to go and subdue. You'll be going for meetings. You'll be going to your board meetings. And you'll be carrying him there. And people will be wondering, where is he getting the wisdom with which he's speaking and no, none of us can contradict it? It's because even though they look at you as their colleague because you are living in an Eden vessel, but there's a different source. There's a different life. There is different authority that darkness cannot comprehend. That is the mystery. And that's the kind of men and women that God is raising for this end time revival. That's the kind of men and women that God is calling. And this does not depend on education. It does not depend on intellectualism. It depends on the life. Can a woman in the village who is hearing me, can she walk into that? Why not? The woman in the village is only in the village in terms of the physical uh, earthen vessel. But in terms of the light she carried, it is that light from above. So even though she is sitting in the village, that same light from above, we demonstrate the authority of God. So when you see that old woman lay hands on the sick and say, in the name of Jesus, stand up. And the thing happened. Says, ah. But the woman didn't go to school. She did not need to go to school. She only need to have life. Christ's life. Amen. It is when Christ's life comes and begins to operate in you, that's what God is talking about. That's the cry of his heart today. Now, look at that. The Lord Jesus Christ, wanting to demonstrate that, wanting to show us that that's the kind of life 
he wanted us to live. And that's what he was bringing me you are into. It's not by power. It's not by might. He said, it's by my spirit. Everyone that will do anything in the coming move of God, it is not by power. It's not by intellectual capacity. It's not by human strength. It is by him who lives in you and walks in you. Hallelujah. Now, in the book of John, the Lord Jesus wanted to show us that that is the mystery of all the secret things that he was doing. Look at John chapter 14, verse 10, all of you please. If you can quickly read that for me. And I wish we can get it from other versions. I'm reading King James, but I want someone who can get it for us from NIV, from uh, Good News. Uh, I will read from Amplified here if I can get it. But let's quickly move. He said, Believest thou not that I am in the Father? And the Father in me? The words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself, but of the Father that dwells in me. The Father that dwells in me, he doeth the works. And I've said, don't you believe that I'm in the Father? And that the Father is in me? The words that I say to you are not just my own. Rather, it is the Father doing what? Living in me who is doing his work. Amen. Is there a living Bible here that someone could help us read? Living Bible, please. Don't you believe that I'm in the Father? And the Father is in me. The words that I say are not my own, but are from my Father who lives in me. He does his work through me. So you see, the man that God is looking for is only but a container through which God can do his work. Will you read Philippians chapter 2 for me? Wherefore, my beloved... As you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God, all of you know that, which does what? Which works in you, both to will and to do of his good pleasure. NIV, please. For it is God, who is at work in you. It is God who works in you, both to will and to act according to his good purpose. I'll read from the Amplified here. Let me start from verse 12. Please move 12, 12, before we get to 13. Therefore, my dear ones, as you have always obeyed, you have always obeyed my suggestion. So now, not only with the enthusiasm you will show in my presence, but much more because I am absent. Work out, cultivate, carry out the goal to the goal, and fully complete your own salvation with reference and awe and trembling, self uh, with with serious caution, tenderness of conscience, watchfulness against temptation, timidly shrinking, from whatever, whatever might offend God and discredit the name of Christ. Now, when you have read all those verse 12, it said, look, all I want, you must, you must shrink from whatever might offend God and discredit the name of Jesus Christ, but not in your own strength, verse 13, but not in your own strength. For it is God who is all the while effectually at work in you. I want all of you to note this now. The man that will overcome the world is the man in whom the Lord Jesus Christ is operating. All the work that we can do for God on earth 
is the work that Jesus, the worker of God's work, can do both in us and through us. That's why I am having great faith to, today to say to you that if God will find empty vessels again, if God will find men that are emptied of self, emptied of the rubbish of the old nature, and who are saying, I'm presenting my body as a living sacrifice. I'm giving my body emptied for you to use. He will feel it. He will first feel it. The first feeling that we are going to see is the feeling of this, my empty vessel, with Christ's life. It is Christ in you that is the hope of glory. It is Christ at work in you. It is Christ moving in you. It is Christ praying in you. It is Christ preaching in you. It is Christ teaching in you. It is Christ reaching out to men in you that will bring the result we are looking for. Not in your own strength. For it is God who is all the while, all the while, all the while at work in you, energizing you, creating in you the power and the desire, both to will and to work for his good pleasure and satisfaction and delight. It is God that wants to work in you. And so for this morning, what exactly has God provided for us to subdue the earth, if you ask me? What has God put in my hand to subdue the earth? Himself. Did you hear me? What is God giving me for me to do the work he has called me to do? He is not giving me money in the first instance. He is not giving me clothes in the first instance. He is giving me himself. He said, Bile, allow me to live in you and walk in you. Let me live in you and bring in my glory. Let me operate in you and affect your generation. Let me operate in you and convict sinners of their sins. I'll be working through you to do that. So where is the power for me to do the things that God said I should do? Where is my own power? I have no power of my own. We are only carriers of his own power. So you say so, Bragbile, what is my own contribution to this? Only one matter. And what is that matter? Empty container. Empty container. Empty container. When God made the first man, it was an empty container. In fact, he lay down lifeless until he poured into him his own life and then he became a living soul. And unfortunately, what the devil did was to quench that life and replace it with Mr. Flesh. And what Jesus came to do was to go to the cross to terminate that enemy inside. I'm telling you that your face is not the problem. Your hand is not the problem. Your body has never been the problem with God. He made your body. He wants to use that body. When Jesus came to the earth, he said, a body have you prepared for me. And I'm telling you, God prepare your body so that you can live in it. Your body is not for fornication, please. Your body is not for drunkenness. God did not create your body for sickness. God created that body to be a carrier, a container where he, Jesus, will live his life and do his work and glorify his father, but through me. Time has come for me to stop, and I need to ask you to rise in prayer, but the first thing I just want to note is taking me so long to be able to come to this point, which is only but the basic point for us to take off from in pursuing the coming revival. The coming revival is not those who are energetic. So don't say I'm not energetic. We don't need energy. The coming revival is not for the educated. Don't say it's because I'm not educated. 
Even though you are educated and you should be educated and if you can, go and read more. But let me inform you that it is not your education that will bring us what we are looking for. It is Christ in you. So when you go to school, when you go to do research, don't forget after all you're getting, if you don't get Christ's life at work in you, you will be as useless in what we are talking about. Speaking big grammar cannot subdue the devil. It is Christ's life at work in you that will bring that matter about. So as you are going to join me in prayer now, the first desperation that our brother discussed when he brought us the money challenge, desperation to have this life, desperation to experience this life, to know that if I have no Christ in me, I am a bunduku man. Oh my God, you may have plenty of money in your pocket, but you have no Christ. What do you have? Nothing. The devil will mess you up. You'll be going from one hospital to another. He will be kicking you up and down like football. He doesn't fear money. He himself is the originator of mammon. That's not important to him. What matters, what the devil fears most, is for you to have that life light that he cannot comprehend. And so this morning, only one matter that I present before you. Will you be a container for this life light? Will you be evacuated, emptied, so that Christ can have space to live in you? Many of you want to be great preachers. And I can see some of you are learning how to have put this uh, sermon together. How to have put that one together. And I laugh. It is not you who we preach. It will be him. I wish I can teach you that song. It is no longer I that live it, but Christ that live it in me. It is no longer I that live it, but Christ that live it in me. In me. In me, Jesus is the life within me. It is no longer I that live it, but Christ that live it in me. That's the life that overcomes. That's the life that will subdue darkness. That's the life that the devil does not want the church to carry. He wants you to do everything else, but not to concentrate on possessing this life. Now, it's time for you to pray with me. It's time for you to arise wherever you are. And I want to appreciate the local chiefs, our traditional rulers, royal fathers that are in our midst, in different centers. Yet, I want to say to you, the only thing that could make you have dominion even over your people, is if Christ is at work in you. It is not the power of darkness. It is not going to consult their powers and ancient fathers. It is Christ in you that will make you the man of authority. And as we are going to God in prayer, it's my desire that even this morning, you are going to say, Lord, Jesus, come and take your space in my heart. Come and take your space in my life. Come and rule in me so that I can reign in life by this one life, Jesus. Can we all rise up wherever you are? Wherever you are? Now, and this is a universal experience. Wherever you are, whosoever you are, whatever be your state in life, please stand up before God this moment and say, Lord, you created me an Edim vessel, so as to carry your own life. My body was not created for anything else. I want you to come and take your place in my heart. Come and take your space in my heart. Every other thing that is occupying my heart, all the furnitures that the old nature put there, pack it aside, oh God, and take your space. Let's pray. Let's call on God. Let's call on God this morning. All over the place, 
wherever you are, South Africa, Zimbabwe, God is saying, all I need, all I need is a space to walk in you. Don't ever think that, oh, but we are too small. That's not the question. If Jesus finds a space to walk in your life, then that's the beginning of revival. Those of you that are in Pakistan, don't say, but we're in a Muslim community and we cannot do anything. No! Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Can you stand where you are and say, oh Lord Jesus, come and take your place. Come and take your place in me. Come and take your place in me. The only provision to subdue the earth is Christ's life in you. The only power you need to overcome is Christ living in you, Christ walking in you, Christ speaking in you, Christ reigning in you. Can you open up and say, Lord Jesus, even in my nation, all I need is for you to be in me. All I need is for you to walk in me. Thank you, my dear brother from Pakistan. Jesus is stepping into your life and you are saying, Lord, even though I appear ordinary, if I carry the man of Calvary, if I carry him who overcomes, who overcomes, I will be an overcomer. Go ahead, go ahead. Go ahead and pray. We are talking to God this morning. Today is a very critical day. Today is a time that the Holy Spirit had given and God is doing a walk in the midst of his people. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. All I'm asking you now is to say, Lord, empty me of everything else. Come and take your space in my heart. Come and take your place in my heart. Come and take your place. Come and take your place. It is because the enemy took away that space. That's why we became victims. That's why death was raining. That's why sickness was troubling your body. That's why you are up and down. Tell him to come back. Let the king come back. Tell all the gates, all the doors, open, open, open. Let the king of glory come in. 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 Are you a young man? Open to Jesus and say, Lord, come and reign. Come and reign. Come and reign in my life. Come and reign in my heart. Come and do what I could not have done. Come and do your work here. Come and do your work here. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, as you stand before God, can you particularly now say, now, Jesus, I live only for you. I stretch forth my hand to you this morning. Come and take your place. Come and take your place. What had used you for 50 years is not the reason you were born. It's not the reason you were born. You were born, you were created to carry Jesus. To carry his life. The time you have spent for the old man is enough. I want you to declare that the time I spent living for the flesh is enough. I thought I was doing something, it was just pushing me up and down. Now Lord Jesus, take your space. Take your space. Take your place in my heart. I give you space. Come and reign in my heart. Thank you. God bless you. As you raise that hand to heaven, I'm not sure I can call you to the altar this morning, but I want you to do two things. Raise that hand and say, now Jesus, take your space. Now it is clear that I was created to be your dwelling place. I was created so that you can live your life in me and reign in me. It is you that will do all that God is asking me to do. You will do it in me. And so this moment, I stretch forth my hand to you and I'm desperately saying, come in, take your space, take your space. Thank you very much. Wherever you are, I want you to be on your feet. Lift up your two hands and let's ask him, take your space. Take your space. Take your space in me. Take your space in my heart. I don't want to return empty. I don't want to go back with the old nature. 
It's you that must reign in me. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. As you raise those hands, the Lord Jesus is stepping in. He's taking space. You will no longer live by struggling. You will no longer do anything by human effort. It will be him at work in you. Thank you. God bless you. Thank you. God bless you. Wherever you are, wherever you are, all over the, the, the face of the earth, even those of you that are just in your house, it is time for you to lift those two hands and say, now I, I was not created for the flesh to live in me. I was not created for sin to be operating in me. I was not created for me just to be struggling. I was created to bear your life, your life that is surpassing all others. When we come back and we are seeing the glory of that life, you will see where God is going. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. With those hands lifted to heaven, let it be a covenant between you and him today. Say, I live for Jesus. Day after day, I live for Jesus. Let come what may, the Holy Spirit, I will obey. I live for Jesus. Day after day, day after day, I live for Jesus. Day after day, I live for Jesus. I live for Jesus. Let come what may the Holy Spirit. I will obey. I live for Jesus day after day. Father, thank you for this hour. As your children are lifting up their hands all over the earth, some are doing it privately in their rooms. Some of us are standing together in, a, in, in our different centers, different parts of countries and nations of the earth. And we are saying, now we know. The reason why you died is that none of us will be living for self. You died to make this container empty and free for you to live in us. Now we also stretch forth our hand and say, now take your place. Lord Jesus, come and live your life, but inside our Eden vessels. That from now, your holiness, you will live it in us. Your love, you will demonstrate it in us. Your passion, you will manifest it in us. Your wisdom, the wisdom of God, the righteousness of God, will begin to emanate from our mortal bodies. Because it's no longer us doing it. It's Christ doing his work in us. Father, this afternoon I'm asking, gain the space in our hearts. All across the globe, gain the space. Gain the space in these lives. And from now, oh God, Put your mark upon their lives. Set them apart as your temple. And through them, oh God, we will see what you will do in the nations. We will see how you will walk in the nations. We will see what you will do in our local churches. Lord, do so and let your name be glorified. Thank you for this moment. Thank you for hearing our prayer. In Jesus Christ's name, we have prayed. Amen.